next speakers are Goss and Geko or Geo from the Tor project. Uh, they both became on the onto the project. Uh, a couple of uh, have been working with the project for a long time now, and uh, a couple of years ago, they both became came on as employees. Goss as the team leader of uh, as the community lead of the project, and Geo as the network team lead, where he has been working on improving the health of the network and making sure that bad relays are removed. Give them all a great round of applause home from uh, from home and uh, welcome to the stage guys take it away hello everyone hello um, this is gear from the tour project and i have got with me today to talk about um the state of the onion a uh, yearly thing and um, we are really happy to be here at the ccc and uh, think about providing an update what we did what we're excited about next year and uh, what is basically in the pipeline before we start um assuming we have some folks watching this talk um wondering what this tour thing is um we thought about picking them up getting them up to speed and talking a bit about what we are actually talking about here so tour is con concerned with the online anonymity and censorship circumvention it's um, we produce free software and we actually have an open network of, of relay operators and relays and operated by by volunteers but that's not the only meaning of tour you, you find we are as well um you know in community of, of researchers developers users and they mentioned relay operators as a project we are a us um, 501c3 nonprofit organization um, so that's the, uh, the different notation, uh, notions of, of Tor you might uh, encounter. So what is, what is actually the Tor design? How does it help with the anonymity goal or censorship circumvention goal? So as, assume you have two parties um, who want to communicate over the internet um, and um, they want, in particular, Alice wants to hide their, their location or their IP address so they, they can connect directly to Bob because that would be obvious where they are coming from. So they, they try to um, get their traffic through multiple relays. So no single relay can actually betray Alice here and um, find out now what Alice is up to or where she is, where she is coming from. So what Alice is, is, is doing or actually Alice Tor client on, on, on her machine um, it's picking a path through the network with uh, three relays um, mentioned here with R1, R2, and R3 before um, she's finally reaching Bob. So this looks like some, something like this here. Um, and at the end, the uh, Alice is asking the exit relay or relay three in this, in this, um, on this slide to connect to Bob and then they can talk to each other. That's the, um, um, the the basic underlying concept um, of Tor. Then there's the the problem that we we sometimes see censorship in in the wild, uh, which means that an adversary is trying to prevent Alice from um, actually reaching the Tor network, and uh, so that she can benefit from the privacy properties um, the network is providing. And in this case, um, the direct connection to the uh, to the cloud uh, above there with the public relays is prevented. And what Alice needs to do is um, to connect to so-called bridges, which are non-public relays in this case, um, which which uh, work as a first hop, and then she is picking the usual remaining two hops before connecting to Bob. So this is a rough idea of how Tor is trying to prevent censorship um, or to bypass censorship to be uh, more cor correctly and um, which, will play, which will play a role in the coming slides because we talk a bunch about um, under censorship work we do and uh, have done and, and want to do so that's basically uh, tour in a nutshell um, there's there are many more things to tour but that's hopefully enough to understand what the following updates are about so if you um, if you recall the previous slides, um, that was basically trying to provide privacy at the network layer for 
um, for users hiding their IP addresses. But as we know, the web, and in particular browsers, are large beasts, and that's by far not enough anymore to guarantee any meaningful privacy on the internet because of all the tracking mechanisms and uh, ways of fingerprint users. So uh, a couple of years ago, we essentially started to provide a tool called Tor Browser, which is essentially a, a fork of Firefox um, and uh, has a dozens of patches on top of that. So we can actually provide the, the privacy guarantees we think are important. And this tool got some, uh, you know, some meaningful updates um, over the, uh, the year. And one of this is that we overhauled the, the Tor connection experience. Um, some of you um, who are already familiar with Tor Browser um, know about this weird modal dialog popping up once they, they start Tor Browser, which was um, up until the Tor Browser 10.5 the default way of, of connecting to, um, uh, to the Tor network with the Tor browser. And this is gone because that's a really weird experience. If you have a any other browser, what is happening once you start it, you get a browser window and then start uh, searching or, or, or typing or whatever. You never get any modal dialogue, which is um, um, a UX experience, which is not really the best. So we fixed that. There's no modal, uh, modal dialogue during startup anymore. And there are easy ways to, uh, as an easy way to connect automatically now. So you don't even see this particular starting screen anymore. Overall, it's giving a much smoother experience um, for your uh, Tor browser usage, uh, which is pretty exciting. Then uh, we finally deployed Snowflake, which is a, a means for um, helping censored users. On, on the internet, which is you know kind of a next, next, next level step in the arms race um, against sensors. Um, and this has been in the works for a couple of years and has been testing for months in, in our alpha release series and finally made it earlier this year and stable. Um, and you can see in, in this on this graph how the, um, the usage um, grew over, over time, starting with um, the initial launch in the stable series. At the beginning of July this year, you see there's a um, continually growing numbers of Snowflake um, users. You see at the at the right side the uh, the spike up and down, and guys will talk about this a bit later. Um, but it's it's a growth, and we can see this, and we can hear the feedback for users. So what you can help is. Um, Running snowflakes. How how this is uh, going to um, to work is uh, a thing Gus will explain later on. But there's already a thing you can uh, try to remember and getting out of this talk, so you can help censored users. Um, yeah, that's two of the highlights for this year. For for the next year and upcoming years, we plan to make it even easier to uh, help um, censored users around the world. Um, for instance, by uh, faster updating the default bridges we ship with Tor Browser. Usually what's happening right now is that um, once we want to um, bundle new bridges to a Tor Browser, we have to have a, a new release, which is pretty cumbersome and slow. Um, we want to make this faster so that you can keep your Tor Browser, but get uh, updated bridges if there are any available, which we can ship. And then we, continue working on the general idea of um, just helping users um, bypassing their censorship. They should have a button like, I'm censored, and then Tor Browser should figure out everything it needs to provide the working bridges for the re uh, for the user in the particular region um, where they are. That's the, the kind of the golden standard um, where we want to, to get to. Um, so this will be pretty exciting work. Then for another project, actually a multi-year project, which we recently started, uh, I want to give an update. Um, the Tor Browser thing is, is pretty cool in the sense that you have a, an app, uh, and then you have per, uh, per app settings kind of, and uh, per, per app uh, means of, of providing privacy properties. But in particular on mobile, where you have kind of dozens or hundreds of apps, 
it's pretty um, cumbersome if it's usable or, or possible at all to um, configure um, every app to every app to to use Tor as a proxy. So what we want, or we actually want, or what users want on mobile at least, is a way to um, to route um, all safe traffic uh, and, and specific safe applications th through Tor. Um, you, you don't want to configure this per app. Um, though that's that's not the the way to go. Um, that's a pretty VPN-like functionality to do. I put VPN in, in quotes here because that's kind of a working, you know, concept. We we probably want to um, come come up with the with a better term at the the final product because um, VPN is kind of tainted and and there people have particular understandings of what it, what it means the VPN is and and. We have kind of a, a new tool here um, where, where Tor is trying to, to fill the a niche and, and provide better guarantees and than regular VPNs do. So we want probably come up with a different term, but that's pretty close uh, from the from functionality point of view what what Tor wants to do. And the the um, the bonus points here as well are that um, we can easily expand our censorship circumvention means to uh, um, the whole device and don't have to deal with that on a per app basis either. The work is done with the with our friends from the Guardian project and the Leap Encryption Access project, which is exciting. And um, we plan to have this available on Android first, likely starting in 2023. Um, maybe already at the end of next year, we'll see. As I said, it's a multi-year project. It's spanning different teams at Tor. Um, it's it's using the uh, it's using RT, um, the uh, new Rust-based Tor client we are currently writing. So that's um, a pretty exciting project, uh, and we hope we make serious progress over next year. So let me leave the um, the application part right now and talk a bit about uh, what we could call network health. The one of the points uh, which frequently comes up, which is important, is our work in the bad relay area. Um, the the overall the dealing with malicious relays remains hard with our limited resources. We, we removed, for instance, several large groups of exit relays in early 2021, and used this actually as kind of a wake up call to seriously invest in in this area, which means um, uh, writing new scanners for detecting malicious behavior and um, do a better monitoring for, for malicious behavior on the network. And I think um, over the year, um, I'm confident to say that we actually got a safer Tor network. And compared with uh, previous years, I think it's fair to say as well that we right now have a safer Tor network as well um, compared to, the, to what we had in the, in the previous years. So that is um, exciting progress um, worth mentioning here. But that's not enough, right? So what we actually want to do to provide an even safer experience and, and, and tackling the, the, uh, the problem of malicious relays more at the core is uh, leveraging uh, trust in our relay community, helping with, with, with those problems. And, and the key point to take away here is that it's a mixed approach in a sense that we have technical uh, tools helping with uh, bad relay work. But as well, this is a social approach, which is important here, because um, we can solve the, the problem of malicious relays uh, with technical means alone. And um, uh, this is a, a thing we take into account right now already. Um, we, we started um, successfully, I think, with experiments. For instance, we, we removed like three weeks ago two large groups of of relays which we deem to be malicious, which were perfectly configured uh, from a uh, configuration perspective. Um, they had all the my family settings set, and they had uh, a contact info information set, which was supposed to be non-spoofable. Um, so they did all the technical parts right, but still, once we started to contact them and and tried to talk with them, it was pretty clear they they were very likely malicious and we removed them quickly from the network, which showed us once more that um, there's a social component here too, which is important. And this will be um, a priority for the network health uh, 
team, not only for the team, I mean, there's a community team involved as well and, and other teams too, but it would be important for, for the Tor project in 2022. Um, what this means at the end, you know, taking trust into account is not set yet. There could be the idea that we uh, say, okay, we have here a large group of trusted relays and they get more traffic to see, overall more traffic to see from users compared to the um, um, non-trusted group. Um, this is performance implications and many other implications which we need to explore in detail starting um, this year and, and but more next year and probably for the coming years. Which actually brings me to my final point on, uh, for my part, which is talking a bit about the total performance and, and the work we did this year uh, and what's coming up next. So if you look at these uh, in this graph um, or those two graphs, you see a growing gap between um, the bandwidth which is advertised on the network and the actually used bandwidth um, over the years, starting from, you know, kind of 2011 and continuing up until today. This is kind of counterintuitive because one of the things we um, usually get as, as kind of most of the uh, uh, most important complaint is that it was slow. So, so what's the issue here? If we have uh, so much kind of surplus bandwidth, but it's not getting used. But on the other hand, users are com complaining towards slow. So we have a project which is trying to solve those problems. Now, we think that a big part of, of this um, equation is coming up with a good congestion control for the tour network, which was lacking so far, so that we have an overall better bandwidth usage. Um, and this got implemented this year which is exciting and will be deployed next year. And, and we hopefully see um, not this growing gap anymore, but this shrinking gap. Um, additionally, uh, one thing we, we, we sorely missed was feedback for relay operators, whether their relays are doing well, whether they are overloaded, um, and whether they can improve settings um, and, and, and make the problem modifications so we implemented a series of kind of warnings or, or triggers which really operators can monitor and we uh, from the tour project side can monitor as well. And then we um, can, can ping really operators and helping um, them figure out their stuff and getting those uh, issues fixed, resolving the overload um, they see on, on their relays. And um, planning for, plan for 2022 as well is that we start do better load balancing by um, figuring out which relay, relays are seriously overloaded and uh, moving traffic from them back to less overloaded relays, giving an overall better performance and, and user experience for our users. So I think that's all I had to say from my side. Uh, thanks for listening. And now Gus will pick this up. Thank you, Gior. So hello, Jesus Gus from the Tor project. And today I will talk a little bit about the community team and our work on, on, on the Tor community. So we will cover uh, user support, the new user support forum, uh, our new gamification project, uh, the run a bridge campaign that we started last month. And, and we are also going to talk about the censorship, the Tor censorship in Russia. So, oops, here it is. So for the TAR forum, uh, we, at the beginning of this year, we start to think about having a place where people can ask questions that is not a mailing list. So in 2021, how, what looks like a, a, a support forum, you know? Uh, how, where users can do questions and receive help. So email and user documentation are nice, are cool, are important because people in sensor regions, they can access this resource. They can send an email from Iran, from China, from Russia now, and they can access our documentation. But uh, we were thinking about other, other ways to reach out to this community, to find places, to find a, a way to, to them to communicate and ask questions. So part of this plan is to, the first part of this plan is to have the TAR forum. 
so people can access this information and ask questions on a new user support forum that's friendly and you can install an app on your phone and, and contact and talk with others. And uh, later I will talk about the second part of this plan. So we launched the Tor Forum uh, this year uh, uh, in, in October and it's been, it's been very nice and I invite everyone to join our, our Tor Forum. The other project that we are doing at the community team is the a gamification project for relay operators. So the idea is to understand what, what are the motivations, how we can incentivize the Tor, Tor network, how we can grow the Tor network basically, or why people are stopping to run relays. So we are doing this as part of an internship and Miko is our intern and she's doing this work. And we have a survey online so people can ask some questions and give feedback about their experience running relays. And we, in last month in November, we launched a campaign to get more breeds. And, and so far, uh, well, breeds are very important for users living in sensory countries. This is how they are going to connect to the Tor network. So our plan was to have 200 new OBS4 breeds. OBS4 is a pluggable transport that can obfuscate your Tor connection. And, uh, uh, and we, uh, so the plan was 200 new breeds and the campaign stats at now are uh, 900 uh, new running breeds, 800 new OBS4 breeds, and the network size bump from um, 1,200 to 2,000 breed, new breeds uh, overall. So we, uh, so the campaign was a, is a real success. And we and we you can see on the graph here on the on the screen how the campaign changed the the, the course of the, the network size here. And and so this campaign started in November and in December a, a situation just happened. So in at the beginning of December we and we received a lot of users asking for support in Russia. And it was not, well, we usually have some users asking help, but that time, but this time was different. We received like a lot of user support requests, basically emails asking for our breeds. And that was very strange because we didn't know anything happening. So we started to investigate with UNI, which is a, a open observatory of network interference to understand what was happening so we start to see some anomalies on the Tornet uh, on, on Russia, uh, basically blocking uh, not just our uh, website, but also the Tor network. Uh, and not only the Tor network, but also some Tor breeds. And that was like some, it, uh, we start to look into that to understand what was happening. So, uh, we start to collect information and we put together in a, a ticket. And a few days late, later, we received an email from, from Russian authorities uh, saying that they were going to block the Tor Project domain. In, and basically, if I'll give you a reason, and, and we didn't understand what was happening. So we, I'm going to skip the lawyer part and 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 the the supposed the, the the reasons that they are blocking uh, the Tor project website, and I will focus on what they are actually doing and how that is impacting the Tor network and the Tor community. So Russia is the second country, largest country of Tor users, uh, is United States, Russia, Germany, Netherlands, and other countries that are the top ten, top twenty uh, countries that are using Tor. And, uh, and and we start to look on metrics and see that the, the numbers of our users were, were decreasing in, in December. And we also saw that the bridge users was increasing. So you can see clearly the impact of the censorship on this graph here. And this graph is available on metrics portal too. So the summary here is one, on December 1st, the Russian authorities, they blocked Tor director authorities. So if you have Tor installed on your computer, you cannot bootstrap Tor. Uh, 
uh, they block a tar browser breeds. So if you have tar browser installed, you cannot use these breeds. They also block a domain fronting, Mickey Asia. So if you try to bypass censorship, that was not going to work. They also blocked Snowflake, and I'm going to talk a little bit later. And they also blocked a bunch of tar beds, uh in different uh, internet providers. So um, depends on where you are on Russia, you can use tar, but in other places that was going to be more complicated. And the only way to bypass the censorship at that time on December 1st was to use a breed from breeds.tarproject.org or from our email. And, and so we start to fight the censorship. We launched a Telegram bot that you can get a bridge and that, that, and that bridge is not blocked in Russia. And we test these bridges on our vintage points on Russia to see if they are blocked. If they are blocked, we ask for a relay operator to rotate that IP address. So these bridges are working and we are checking if they are, uh, and we are checking and monitoring if they are working. The Tor community also fight, fought back, and we uh, and the Tor community spin up like uh, more than 400 new Tor breeds in just a few days. Mm -hmm. And we have amazing volunteers translate Tor, user support guides in in, in Russian. And uh, and during after the first block on December first, the anti censorship team also provided a fix for Snowflake, and. And it was and just fix was available on our browser uh, the last release. So you can see on this graph uh, that Snowflake was around like less than two thousand users, but after the December, you can see it take a, a while, but then start to increase the number of Snowflake users in basically because of Russia. And you can see this this graph here. There is a a decrease here is because um, the, the server crashed after too many users. So we fixed the server and, uh, and we start to get more users. So if you want to help people in certain country, you can run a Tor bridge or you can run a Snowflake proxy and that, that will be very helpful for Tor users in Russia. And uh, a new update, uh, during Christmas, we also had a new round of censorship in Russia more breeds were blocked between December 23 and 24. Uh, we are going to reach out to relay operators and, and, and say, and we are going to contact, contact them and say, okay, you need to rotate your IP address if you want to get back in the game and, and fight censorship. And we are going to do that uh, just week. Uh, Snowflake is working fine. And we have been working uh, with, uh, doing user support with Russian users. And we already answered more than 1,300 help requests since December 1st. Just for comparison, we, we solved 140, sorry, 1,400 support tickets between January and November. So in one month, we already have more user support requests from Russia than uh, in a whole one, in, a, in 12 months, basically. So, uh, so, the call, uh, I will do a call here for the Internet Freedom Community to spin up a tar bridge or run a Zoflake proxy. Uh, if you can, if you cannot run a bridge, you can donate to relay associations. Uh, if you cannot donate, you can help and teach tar users about uh, uh, about bridges, or you can help localize tar in Russia, or you can do we can apply pressure. Uh, like if you are part of a digital rights organization or a human rights organization, uh, help us to make pressure on Russia government uh, and stand up in solidarity, like Edward Snowden did and publish this uh, calling the, the Russian government to stop blocking TOR. Uh, how to get involved? Uh, we are available on TOR IRC and Matrix channels. You can join us, uh, our mailing list, they are public and you can see what we are talking and, and you can help. You can also join the TOR forum and you can contribute on our GitLab. And for next year, we are going to improve, we are going to continue to improve our user support tools for users living in sister, uh, countries or regions. Uh, so one of our ideas is to provide a Telegram uh, a chat channel 
so users can communicate and have and get user support on, on Telegram. We are going to continue to develop the Tor Relay gamification project and uh, continue to organize Tor trainings in the global south, in Latin America and East Africa, and organize relay operators meetups. Uh, today, we are going to have a relay, meet, relay operator meetup at uh, 10 p.m. German time. And the link you can find on Tor Relay mailing list. And also, if you search on Twitter or social media, you can also find that. Um, and the, uh, today we just covered some topics from the State of the Union. We, some uh, one month ago, we did a, a huge presentation, like two hours and, and a half, about anti-censorship, fundraising, UX, CISADMIN, and many other updates about uh, RT, about uh, V2 Onion deprecation, and many other topics. And you can watch that on YouTube. So I think that's it from my side, and uh, and we are open for more questions. Thank you so much, guys. Like obviously, Tor is a really important project, and it's um, honestly great to see how dedicated you are to uh, to basically helping everyone. I was actually uh, now we're going to go on to the question, and I was actually wondering something myself before we uh, we head over to uh, to taking the ones coming in from the internet. Um, basically, I, as far as I understand, like when you working with bridges and making sure to like avoid this censorship and everything, like as far as I understand, an important tool in this process are the meet bridges where you use huge cloud providers to basically mask traffic to Tor as like regular HTTPS website traffic. Does that not work in the case of Russia or like what does the attack threat situation look like at the moment in that landscape? I can answer in two parts. Uh, the first part is that uh, some cloud providers, they don't like domain fronting. And so Amazon um, and others, they, they, they change their policy and they start to block, uh, well, not just block, but to remove uh, projects that were using domain fronting. So uh, the only cloud provider that allows Star or allow it to to do that was uh, Azure, and we and we had to limit the the bandwidth on that. So if you use Mickey Azure on Tor browser, it's going to be very slow. And um, and one thing that we so this is the first part. Like the the providers, they don't like that. They were enforcing us to stop or remove remove uh, just support. The other thing is that the, the bill, like the cost of running uh, uh, a Mickey Azure breed or, or a Mickey Amazon breed, that was too high uh, and too costly. So uh, Snowflake is, uh, is the next uh, step here because it used, Mickey, uh, it used domain fronting to, to connect you to a Tor proxy, uh, Snowflake proxy. And the cost will be like um, very cheap, so you can you can get the the benefit of domain fronting, and you can use uh, uh, a, a lot of proxies to connect Tor users, and that will not cost uh, a lot of money for for the Tor project and for for Tor users. So that's uh, is the way to go here. It's not look back, but look forward. <laughs> It sounds so cool. Like, obviously, it, it seems that this was very important. And actually hearing like some of the problems that you guys are facing in your fight, I think that's very interesting for, for all of us. So uh, questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is that the apps that uh, you're making, like it, the question is whether they would make you identifiable. So basically, if exactly those five apps are always calling home over the same tour notes, the, the question is if that if someone could link that back to you. Hmm. Do you want to talk about this, Des? Or should I? Go ahead. Yeah, I think this should not be the case. I mean, depending on what kind of apps you have, how they are configured um, and um, some, some potential, you know, timing signatures and stuff. So 
that's one of the things we are concerned, for instance, with Tor Browser and um, trying to really make sure to uh, break this up in the sense that uh, folks can't uh, learn anything about those uh, patterns you have. It's hard, uh, in particular, if um, adversaries can monitor you know, exit nodes or endpoints over a long period of time. But generally, you should be protected from this kind of threat. Right, that makes sense. So the next question is uh, that if they understand correctly, the Tor organization is registered in the United States. Could the project be in danger of any government pressure to be discontinued? And have you guys ever planned to move to more net neutral countries like Switzerland or similar? I um, so from my point of view, I, I don't think we suffer any pressure right now from US government. So I think uh, would, what would be interesting, well, one thing that uh, is important is, one thing is the TAR project, and the other thing is the TAR network. The TAR network is, uh, we have director authorities in different countries, and that uh, just to, to avoid this kind of government pressure against the TOR network. So I think, um, I think the question would be more like uh, finding different ways to fund, uh, to, to make TOR sustainable, uh, not just uh, like diversifying our funds uh, so we don't be uh, too connected with a government or, or one source provider of resource. Uh, I think this is happening right now. Uh, Isabella, the executive director, has changing a lot of our uh, money income. Uh, in, if you look back in the history, US government was uh, adding a lot of money uh, through uh, to the TOR project in different uh, by different ways. You know, like a. Uh, human rights projects and uh, internet freedom projects. And this was basically how TAR is and was funded uh, by US, US government, but not just US government, other governments like uh, Swedish government too. So I think uh, I would be more concerned about the TAR director authorities uh, being in just one country. And that's not true. We are in different countries. And I, so far, I don't, I, never heard any kind of um, pressure uh, from the US government against the nonprofit called the TAR project. So I think that is uh, basically my answer here. That's good to hear. And now to um, on to a maybe a little bit lighter question. Do uh, TOR browser users have any chance or hope to see less captures in the future? <laughs> yeah. I think we do have some hope. There is, I mean, not just only hope, but um, we have uh, work ongoing, solving this from different angles. The first one is um, outreach to major providers, um, trying to understand why they are blocking tour or why they provide captures and, and working with them um, to come up with solutions, which is, or which are not only um, deployable by them, but by the wider industry. So there is a knowledge gap here. And then um, trying to, based on that, trying to figure out how we can solve this problem. And that's not only from a you know policy angle, but we plan to look into technical means as well. Uh, for instance, there's the idea of providing um, tokens to to users so they can, which they can spend uh, um, anonymously at, at websites, for instance, um, and the websites can can look for that and try to regulate the traffic, keeping the uh, noisy bots out while providing good service to our toy users providing such a token. Um, that's 
another thing that won't be solved next year. It's a multi-year project too. We are a small organization, so there has to be you know some kind of prioritization. But that's definitely on our radar and a serious problem for us. So we should fix this. Sounds like great initiatives, and also like they're going some of the way in order to to some extent legitimize the use of the Tor browser. Maybe not as much in common society, but also when actually visiting different websites. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Next up is uh, whether you guys are planning to figure out some kind of solutions for firewalls, for instance, the corporate ones that are slowing traffic down. You hmm. I don't know, Gus, do you do you have some, you know, queries or complaints from users for this particular uh, issue? I, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I, f mm. I just, just would be a very specific question. I. It's also very fair to mm. just say that it's not a problem that you've heard a lot of complaints about. Right. Yeah, just a straw. We, I, I didn't hear about that. Like the capture one is a popular one, but this <laughs> one is I never heard. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a bunch of larger things to fry here. Mm. There, it's not really in our, not even our top ten. So there's right. I guess it can also be very hard for you guys to like work with figuring out how to prioritize all the different initiatives and the wishes that that people have. Yeah, definitely. Cool. <laughs> um, so, um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for any more questions right now, but there is a breakout room that people can uh, come to and you will answer any further questions. Uh, for now, we are going to uh, have a break on this channel before the next talk that's going on at uh, 2000, which is Cookie Banner. Das Online Verben Ökosystem und Google Preisträger Big Brother Awards 2021. For now, thank you very much, guys. Take care, and uh, maybe we see you in the breakout room. Mm -hmm.